Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, Rats Patrick Speaker, Mr. Patrick Lam, Honor and Consultant from Straight Knowledge. Rats Patrick, Madam Mr. Na Abu Bakar, Acting Chief Library and Calm, Chief Library, Chief Knowledge Officer and the Library Top Management, Chief Librarians and Participants from other higher learning institutions, Knowledge Champion from the Center of Study and Administration Officers, Distinguished, distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good evening to all participants and good morning to our guest speaker, Mr. Patrick, who is now live streaming from Ireland. I am Anisha Zoni Binti Abidin from the Rahitmah Library IIUM, and I'll be MC for today's talk on knowledge management entitled A Holistic Approach to Knowledge Management in the Organization. Even though we are conducting today's event online, Hopefully, all of us will be able to reap as many fruitful ideas, benefits, and experiences towards effective management of knowledge in our organization. Besides Zoom meetings, today's event is also being streamed live on the, on, on the official IIM Library YouTube channel. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are very honored today to have our guest speaker, Mr. Patrick Lamb, a globally recognized knowledge management practitioner keynote speaker, facilitator, and author. Mr. Patrick was educated at Oxford and London and has mastered in information and library science. He arrived in KL via second career in training and development and has been based in Singapore for three decades. He works with clients around the world in public, private, and development sectors. Patrick's latest book is Principle of Knowledge Auditing Foundations for Knowledge Management Implementation published by the MIT Press in May 2023. He is the author of co I'm sorry, he is the author of Organizing Knowledge, Taxonomy Knowledge and Organization Effectiveness that was published in the year of 2007 and co-author with Nick Milton of the award-winning The Knowledge Managers Second Edition that was published in the year of 2019. Patrick is visiting, is visiting professor in the KIM PhD program at Bangkok University, former president for the International Society for Knowledge Organization Singapore chapter, and a member of the editorial advisory board of the Journal of Knowledge Management, Management for Development Journal, and Journal of Entrepreneurship, Management, and Innovation. Mr. Patrick spent his time between Singapore and Dublin Island. Without further ado, I have now had the distinct to pleasure respects for the inviting our guest to, de to deliver his talk. Over to you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you very much. And thank you to IIUM for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, so I found uh, the, the, the topic um, uh, for this talk to be quite intriguing because each of the key words in that title have some important uh, implications for knowledge management. Um, so what I plan to do, um, 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 this sorry, this slide is just to indicate that a lot of the um, case studies and examples that I'm going to uh, be sharing in this talk come from the book that, um, that was just mentioned, Principles of Knowledge Auditing. So what I've, I propose to do in this talk is it's basically to unpack uh, some of the key words and phrases in the title because uh, they may appear very straightforward and sensible um, but they're not as simple as they look at first sight which I suppose is actually a kind of a mantra for knowledge management in general it sounds straightforward <laughs> and reasonable and common sense but in practice, it's a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to unpack each of those keywords and phrases. I'm going to talk about what we mean by holistic, what do we mean by knowledge management. Um, and since the context here is a university, I also want to give some considerations about what it means to do knowledge management within a university. And I'm going to close with some practical examples and illustrations around what an approach to solving these problems might be, problems around being holistic, problems with uh, understanding the forms that knowledge management can take um, and how we relate them to the needs of a particular organization. So this is a definition of holistic um, from Oxford dictionaries. 
Um, so holistic means uh, that you believe that the parts of something are interconnected and can be explained only by reference to the whole. What does this mean for knowledge management? Well, um, of course it makes sense that you should take the considerations of the whole organization into account. Uh, and it also makes sense to realize that there are different parts to the organization and there may be, may be, may be variations in the needs between those different parts. Um, that, in fact, is one of the biggest problems with knowledge management. It, it, is, it, it sounds, let, let me put it another way, it's easier to say that you can be holistic than it is actually to do it. Um, and the reason is, that knowledge management in practice, as we'll see through these examples in a moment, is extraordinarily sensitive to context, to different differences in context. And even within the same organization, you can have very different kinds of context. Um, and so the idea that you could be and should be holistic in your approach to knowledge management almost immediately becomes subverted once you start looking at the detail of what's going on in an organization. And the temptation is to go back to standard frameworks for knowledge management, go back to theory, go back to standard th frameworks and use those as a reference point. That is not particularly helpful. And I'm going to um, give some examples um, of that. Here's one. This is a um, capability map. Um, it is mapping knowledge management capabilities across two, four, six, eight, ten 10 different departments in the same organization. And it's mapping capabilities around leadership and strategy, information management, knowledge sharing, critical knowledge, learning and improvement, innovation and change. And you can see that there is a great deal of variation across the different parts of the organization. So when you look at um, the average, which is the black line uh, in the middle there, when you look at the average of all of those behaviors, uh, actually that black line doesn't track very closely to any other department except maybe for green. And so if you take an average approach, if you, if you even out all of these differences and take an average approach, you are not actually satisfying the majority of the needs of the organization. So taking a standard framework and applying it across the organization gives you a, what I call a flattening out problem, that your flattened out, your averaged out needs analysis actually doesn't meet the needs um, or the opportunities facing large parts of the organization. Um, here's another example. This is an, another averaging out approach. This is a word analysis of definitions of knowledge management, over 100 definitions of knowledge management, done by two um, very prolific uh, KM authors, uh, Joanne and John Girard. Um, and so they, they, they took over 100 definitions of KM, they did a, a semantic analysis, and they came out with uh, two variations of definition of knowledge management. Knowledge management is the process of creating, sharing, using, and managing the knowledge and information of an organization, or a slight variation, uh, and using organizational knowledge uh, and information. Okay. So when you look at that, you think, mm, yeah, okay, that seems reasonable, but it's not very useful, right? It, there's not something, that, there's nothing added to the body of knowledge on what knowledge management is because all you've done is you've taken uh, frequencies and you've looked at the most frequent things and you've eliminated all of the outliers. And it's the outliers where the interesting stuff happens in knowledge management. It's not the averaged out stuff, the common, the flattened out stuff. Uh, and, and, and when you flatten out, you also remove interesting, interesting outliers. For example, most of the definitions that uh, Girard and Girard looked at are talking about organizational knowledge management. But there are whole areas of interesting and useful uh, knowledge management that are inter-organizational. Think about technology transfer between companies or between a university and commercial companies. Think about the development sector 
where um, development funds are being used to coordinate projects and ministries of transport in different countries and, and build infrastructure uh, within a country. And all of the different uh, uh, parts, moving parts that have to coordinate and share knowledge and learn together. Think about societal or community knowledge management. All of that is removed once you take an averaged out approach. So this is the second example of the dangers of an average averaged out approach. Um, this example is from um, this book by um, L. Todd Rose, um, a very, very readable and useful book. Um, it's not specifically on knowledge management, but it's highly relevant. And the, the example here is from the US Air Force um, in the 1920s, when they were designing air aircraft they figured out what an average pilot of that day, um, what their dimensions were, so that they could um, uh, design the most ergonomically efficient cockpit uh, with, with sort of weight, because weight at that time was a, a, a big factor. So they want to get the, the optimal design in the smallest space for a pilot. And so they, they figured out what an average male at that time uh, pilot uh, dimensions were, and they designed the cockpit for that. And then nothing was done. Um, for about 30 years, and then they realize these cockpits are getting too small because Americans are getting bigger, they're better nutrition, they're taller, fatter, larger, more muscular, whatever it was. And so they went back to the drawing board and said, let's figure out what the average pilots are, size dimensions are, so that we can redesign the cockpit. And they did that. They did a huge study. Um, and what they discovered was that almost nobody came within 15% of the average. So the, today there is no such thing anymore as an average that really matters uh, when it comes to making specific arrangements for specific people in specific contexts. So that's my first um, sort of challenge on, on the word holistic. Taking a holistic view um, is challenging because we have to balance the needs of the organization as a, as a whole. Very difficult to see to perceive what that organization requires as a whole. And at the same time, we have to relate to specific contexts that may vary significantly from the general picture that we're looking at. So holistic, uh, easier said than done. Second phrase I want to look at is uh, knowledge management. And uh, this, is, this presents our, our second challenge uh, because when we think about knowledge management in general, it seems fairly reasonable. I mean, I still get glazed eyes if if I'm at a you know party or a gathering and somebody asks me what do you do, and I say I'm, I'm, I do knowledge management. And they can oh that's interesting. What does that mean? Um, uh, but in general, I think if if we're working within this space, we have a we have a sense of what knowledge management comprises. But then when you look at practice and the forms that knowledge management actually takes in organizations. Um, knowledge management can, be, can, can appear in many, many diverse forms. So on the left-hand side there, we have the appearances of knowledge management. We have you know, knowledge management through library services, through document management, or through communities of practice, and communities of practice themselves can take different forms. A lot of work around communities of practice assumes it's on a technology platform and that people are interacting through that platform. Others take the line that communities of practice are physical gatherings of people who meet regularly on common topics and practices. Um, it could be an internet platform. It could refer to collaborative working, whether it's face-to-face -face or digitally mediated. It could refer to an expertise transfer system. You've got experts, you've got experienced people who are nearing retirement, so we need processes in place to transfer that knowledge uh, to more junior people. It could mean implementing a very specific thing like search. Uh, it could be looking at the front end of, of when people come into the organization and accelerating their learning curve so they become more effective in their roles. Uh, it could be training. Uh, knowledge transfer through training. It could be problem solving and innovation. It could mean technology transfer. I just mentioned that. And in the university context, that's sometimes quite important. Or it could simply mean it's an annual gathering when we all get together and we share where we are at and, and we do our networking and rebuild our networks and sharing for the coming year. 
So the forms that knowledge management can take uh, are very varied, and some of them are very technology mediated, and some of them are very process oriented. And it's it's really hard, quite hard, you know, if you're thinking about this as a shopping list, um, how do I pick the best approaches, knowledge management approaches that are appropriate to our situation, especially if I've got this very averaged out view of my organization. And then on the right hand side, you've got the the things, the levers or the enablers that, that make knowledge management. So the, the things that need to be in place in an organization or that are taken as common knowledge to be need to be in place to allow um, knowledge management to happen. And these are from the ISO 30401 standard, more or less, uh, which is a, an, a new ISO standard for knowledge management systems. I recommend you check it out. Um, so the, the you know the the, the common um, wisdom is that you need leadership buy-in, that you need a KM policy, that you've got defined KM roles, that you have made an alignment with your business strategy, that you are matching knowledge supply with knowledge demand. You're not just pushing knowledge and storing knowledge, but you are looking at the needs and making sure that people with needs get knowledge channeled to them. Um, you're looking at you need to look at knowledge production processes and knowledge storage and access processes and knowledge transfer processes and in fact the ISO standard says you you do not meet the standard if you don't match if you don't meet all of those requirements um, but again in practice um, there are organizations that uh, are actually doing interesting and useful work in knowledge management somewhere inside the organization without leadership buy-in uh, and, and I have case studies in, in my book about that. It is possible to do good knowledge management work without all of these requirements being met. And so, you know, going back to this sense of holistic view, if you take the standard, uh, the ISO standard as a framework and you say, I've got to meet all of these requirements, you could, in fact, and I've seen this happen, you could, in fact, run around trying to meet all the requirements without necessarily meeting organizational needs. So, so that it becomes a performance. It becomes meet, making the appearance of knowledge management in the organization without connecting to specific needs in specific places. And conversely, it is quite possible to meet specific needs with specific KM practices and do good work in knowledge management without necessarily fulfilling all of these requirements. So um, uh, I, hope, <laughs> I hope I have thoroughly confused matters by, by pointing out that two of the most straightforward phrases or terms in the title of this talk are, you know, when you look under the hood, are actually much more complex um, than, uh, than it might appear at first sight. Um, now I want to look at, uh, specific, because this is IIUM, I want to look specifically at the university context, um, um, because we're looking at a holistic approach to knowledge management in the organization. So let's take uh, the university as an example of an organization. Well, again, if you, <laughs> once you look under the hood of a university, um, a, a university is actually a kind of a coalition of different organizations, right, doing different things, um, and there are overlaps between them. Um, but but they there are functionally quite distinct units within a university. So you've got the you know the, the teaching operations of the university, and this is about transfer um, of of knowledge effectively. And then you've got the research part uh, of a university, which is about building of knowledge. And obviously there needs to be some transfer there as well, but it, it, it's primarily focused on building new knowledge. And then you've got the administration of the university, which is about coordination. It's about information flows. It's about right hand knowing what the left hand is doing. It's about making sure that policies are, are filled and, and so on. And then you've got student services and all, all services, and I'm, I'm counting in uh, alumni services there, all services depend on the ability to transfer knowledge from the client, from the customer, to the organization so that the service can be designed in a way that is consumable and useful to the clients, to the customers. And so there's a knowledge flow between the organization and its clients there that needs to take place, two-way knowledge flow, feedback loops. Uh, and alumni services have the additional knowledge management component of network building 
uh, on network maintaining, uh, relationship maintenance. Um, and then you've got commercial partnerships. If the university is engaged in technology transfer projects, then it needs to figure out the commercial marketplace, right? So it needs to understand the market. It needs to understand where the opportunities are. It needs to do technology mapping. It needs to seek out partners. It needs to know how to talk the language of funding and partnering and so on. So each of those functions, even when you look at a university, breaks out into quite distinct uh, knowledge needs and knowledge management needs. And so again, that sense of a holistic view of the organization is, is easier said than done. And I want to give you a, a practical example, uh, a, a very small, well-defined case. We worked with, um, uh, within the space of a, 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 a year or so, we worked with two different training companies uh, in Singapore, training organizations. And they were about the same size. They're about 60 to 80 um, people. Um, they were about, uh, they're, they're handling the corporate market. So they're handling the same kind of market. Um, and they're delivering more or less similar products. So you would have thought, given the similarity in their profiles and their size and their context, that their knowledge management needs would be very similar. Not so. Uh, in one organization, they were uh, staffed, they, their, their brand was on using expatriate trainers. So trainers who would come in from outside the country and stay for two to four years uh, and, and, and deliver training. And so uh, it turned out that their knowledge management needs were one, one of the functions that I talked about earlier, which is getting new staff up to speed, not just in their job and in the course content, because they, they understood that they, they were accredited to teach those courses, um, but they needed to understand how companies in that country operated. So they needed to acquire local knowledge, local knowledge of the country, its culture, its business culture, and then knowledge of the client companies themselves and the history with the organization as a training provider. So this was about acquiring knowledge of the environment for the new people coming in, right? So that's, that's the focus of their knowledge management effort. The second organization um, didn't have that regular turnover of, of teaching staff or training staff um, they had a very stable client base, a very stable trainer base for many, many years. Um, but what, what was happening was that their clients wanted to move, uh, and this, this is partly as a result of that whole movement around the COVID pandemic, they wanted to move to more digital offerings and more hybrid training offerings. And these were trainers who had been with the organization for 10, 15 years in some cases and so they were very very tuned in to classroom teaching right training room teaching face-to-face -face, uh, delivery facilitation and so the, the knowledge management challenge for that company was completely different it was about how do i develop new capabilities in my training staff so that we can build more digitally friendly content so that we can build content that can be delivered remotely um, or that can be developed, developed, delivered through self-learning and then facilitated online. And when you're doing online facilitation, it's a very different kettle of fish from doing face-to-face -face facilitation in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a classroom. And so the challenges that they were facing were completely different. Now, that, that's just a, a very clear-cut example of two organizations that on face value should have similar knowledge management requirements, uh, but because of their very specific circumstances had very different ones. All right, so now I want to, having, having sort of exposed the, the complexities, I want to lay out, uh, you know, all is not lost. <laughs> we, we have 20, 30 years of experience now in trying to figure out how to navigate these things. Um, so now I want to lay out um, you know the, the the elements of an, an approach that seems to work to address these challenges, and up front, I think it 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 um, uh, the the sort of core elements of of a useful and um, practical approach 
um, have, have three elements to them. One is, um, what is the goal? Start with what the goal of the organization is. If you want to anchor your knowledge management uh, in something that is important to the university, and if you want it to be holistic in the sense of you know, respecting the needs of the whole organization, look at the goals of the organization, the business goals, the organizational goals, the mission, the vision, the strategy, the strategic objectives. That's your anchor uh, to which everything else is back. And then um, the second element is then, okay, we, we understood the goals. Now, now let's look at the, the key decisions or the actions undertaken by the organization that are relevant to the goal. So don't look at everything that the organization does. Look at the decisions, key decisions, critical decisions or critical actions or functions that are relevant to the goal. And that's like taking a series of, you know, binocular or telescope, view, telescope views to understand those decisions or actions. And in, then in a further step, once you've identified them, uh, map out the knowledge that is relevant to the decisions or actions that you're looking at, which in turn are relevant to the goal. So, so when you get your knowledge maps out of this uh, example, out of these example activities and functions, you know that these knowledge maps are relevant to the overall goal of the organization. And you can trace the lineage um, of, of that knowledge and how it contributes to the organization's goal. So that seems to be the, the sort of the, the most useful framing to a, a develop a, a knowledge management um, approach, which is going to respect contexts. That's your middle layer there, where you're looking at specific contexts, while also respecting the overall um, objectives or goal of the organization. Now, I'm, before I get into sort of detailed examples, I just wanted to pause there and see if there are any questions. Not at the moment, Mr. Bethany. Not at the moment? Okay, all right. That's so feel free to punch questions into the chat channel or, or observations or comments as, as you go. All right. So basic principle. Um, um, you know, once you've got that framing in place, we're framing around, we're anchoring around the goals of the organization. We're going to look at specific decisions or activities that are relevant to those goals, and then we're going to map out the knowledge. Um, but a basic consideration, once we get into the detail, is that the most interesting knowledge in any organization is the knowledge work happening in people's heads and between people in key interactions. And those are precisely the forms of knowledge which are the least easily observed. Uh, we can observe the stuff in databases. We can observe the stuff in libraries. We can observe the stuff in document management systems because they are relatively, even if they're digital, they are uh, retrievable. You can you can look at them. You can retrieve them. You can manipulate them. You can send them. You can share them. It's very easy to see, observe, and figure them out. One of the early challenges, um, you know, it, it, back in the 1990s, when knowledge audits and knowledge mapping exercises first started to be practiced systematically, one of the earliest challenges was that. Um, the, 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 we basically had a, 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 a dual or a bipolar definition of knowledge. We've got the explicit knowledge, which is in artifacts and publications and databases and documents. And then we've got the tacit knowledge, which is in people's heads. And that's not a particularly useful um, typology of types of knowledge because a, it's not very differentiated. You know, it's 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 binary. It's either tacit or it's explicit. And B, the explicit stuff is easy to see, and the tacit stuff is not easy to see. So, of course, when you do, when you don't have a, a highly differentiated typology or taxonomy of knowledge, um, what will happen is that you tend to bias your observations towards what you can see, and what you can document. And so there's a, a quite a well-known case study. It's in, in my book, 
um, from a power company in the UK uh, in the late 1990s or early 2000s, um, where they took this approach. They went, they went through the organization. They talked to key people looking at key activities. You know, they, they did the proper stuff. Did, what are our uh, corporate objectives? Uh, what are the key activities and decisions? Let's go and talk to the people who have performed those activities. Let's map the knowledge, the explicit stuff, the tacit stuff. And what they found was that they were getting lots of detail on the explicit knowledge. And they were getting very generalized motherhood statements on the tacit knowledge, not very well defined. And so obviously, what when it came down to um, uh, making decisions, um, tacit knowledge could mean very different things to different people. So there was no common view on what it meant. And so the definition, the, uh, the focus, almost always shifted to managing the explicit knowledge. Easier to see easier to manage. But in fact, it's the tacit knowledge where the opportunities and the risks sit. And so um, it, is, it, it is essential, this is the message of this slide, it is the essential uh, for two things to happen to get a good, rich, contextually specific view or set of views on an organization. If you want to focus on the knowledge that is interesting uh, as what not just the, the explicit stuff the explicit stuff is important but if you want to focus on the stuff that is also very interesting and contains lots of risks and opportunities you need two things one is you need to take a multi-lens approach because you, because you cannot see directly much of the interesting knowledge work in an organization you need to take different lenses, frameworks onto that landscape so that you can kind of triangulate what's going on. If you pick up a pattern using one instrument, you can check another instrument to see if you're picking up the same pattern. So it's kind of you know figuring out by abstraction or by, by pattern analysis, what's going on in this space that you can't see using proxies uh, to do that. So. Um, good practice in knowledge management assessments, in knowledge audits, in knowledge mapping, is to use a multi-lens, multi-instrument approach. Don't just you rely on one instrument. Um, for example, don't just rely on surveys and interviews, um, because they only give you a very partial view of what's going on in the organization. Second requirement is to use a typology of knowledge which is more differentiated, which shows different forms of knowledge in a way that is easily understood by the people you're going to be talking to. Um, so they need, it needs to be naturalistic and it needs to be sufficiently well broken out uh, that you can define different kinds of knowledge in that spectrum between explicit and tacit. And I'm going to give you examples of both of those requirements, taking a multi-lens approach and also uh, having a very differentiated um, typology of knowledge um, types. Mr. Patrick, before you proceed, uh, that's questions um, question by Madam Mazna Zakaria, asking if there are any best method or practices to capture basic knowledge. So from your <laughs> Um, let me let me postpone that until we get to the slides showing the typology okay. of, because that okay, that's right. that, that is that is a very good question that is directly relevant to my point so let me uh, let me pick up that question uh, once we get good. to that slide um what i'm what i'm going to do now is i'm i'm going to talk about the multi lens approach first the so different instruments uh, in combination to get a, a clearer view uh, of of what's going on in the organization and then i'll talk about the typology of knowledge types and how it gives insight. And it will, it, 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 once you have a good typology, um, it then becomes much easier to see which methods might work for which types of knowledge. So I'll, I'll come back to that. Thank you for that. Um, so this slide, it's a bit busy, um, but this is just an illustrative approach. This is a, a sequence of activities that we uh, frequently, we use kind of combinations of these approaches in the knowledge audits and KM assessments that, that we perform. Uh, this is not the only possible type of exercise. It's just an illustration. Uh, different organizations have different purposes. When they're doing KM assessments, they use different instruments. The point is that you are using multiple different instruments to look at the same, uh, 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 organize, uh, same, same landscape. 
not that you should use this sequence, this particular sequence and combination of instruments. So I don't want to mislead you on that. This is just illustrative. Um, but if you look at this, this is a, a kind of a flow of the type of steps and instruments we go through in a very typical KM assessment that we work on. Uh, we start with number one, uh, that's the goals, right? Why, why are we doing knowledge management? What are your organizational goals? What are you trying to achieve? That's the context, that's the grounding. Uh, we look at the stakeholder needs, and in particular, we look at uh, pain points around knowledge and information use within the stakeholders. Um, the point here is that when you undertake a knowledge management assessment, you always know that you are intending to make changes at the end of the line, right? So you wanna change the way things work. And that's why you're doing a KM assessment. You're trying to figure out what to change, which levers to change to improve the performance of the organization. And because you have change in mind, you already know you're going to have a change management issue. You're going to have to manage change. The best way to manage change is to engage your target communities as early in the process as possible and work with them through the process of sense making around what they need around knowledge management, what they currently do, what their capabilities are, where their opportunities and risks are. And the earlier you engage with them and work with them through this process, the easier it will be for them to understand and adopt the change once it comes down the pipe at the other end. So that's, you see, step two there is engage with the stakeholders and figure out what are the major pain, uh, pain points that they face around knowledge and information use. Um, we, the, now step three is basically a culture analysis. Um, so what are the dominant values, attitudes, and behaviors around knowledge and information? This often helps to explain the pain points that they're experiencing, uh, or it will illustrate the pain points they're illustrating. So these are two different instruments that um, give you uh, different perspectives on the same landscape, which is the point. And then uh, step four there is to do a knowledge mapping exercise. Um, so, uh, and I'll show you examples of that in a moment. So what are the knowledge uh, resources that we use or need to use to perform these key activities? Where are the risks and gaps and so on? And then we look at the um, way up all of the different things that are emerging from the maps and we look at priorities and resources. And here we, we, we can then um, actually take a number of pathways. So we can do um, you know, a general sense of direction and start with some pilots. Um, uh, and this is usually done in an organization that is not really sure about whether it wants to commit resources yet, wants to see the value. So it does some testing, you know, get a, get a simple uh, statement of objectives out there, uh, figure out a place where it might be useful, try it out, see what happens. Uh, could be an organization that's been working with KM for a while and they want to scale. And so they want to figure out where do they put their resources to scale. Uh, and so that's the second strategy choice. And in some cases, it's an organization that is now ready to commit to a full scale knowledge management implementation and strategy. Or it's been doing knowledge management for a while and it wants to do a systematic review. So it goes through those steps one through to five and then it refines its strategy. So there are different strategy choices coming out of it. Uh, but the point is that people are going through the same process, that you're using different instruments to take a view of the same landscape. You're looking at the common patterns, and then you're figuring out where would it be useful to put whatever resources we have on it. Um, and Suhani, I can see your question there. <laughs> does organizational culture affect knowledge management? I think, I think we all know that it does. Um, I look at culture as basically a system of habits that have been picked up. Habits around attitudes, habits around what's valued, and habits around behaviors. Um, and, and we get inculturated into an organization the longer we stay with it, um, which is why new hires are a very useful way to take an objective look at your culture, because new hires are not enculturated yet. Um, I can remember one case where I was hired and, and my boss into a, um, a very culturally specific organization. And my boss, um, you know, in the first week, he said, look, um, 
first two to three weeks, I want you to tell me what you see about how we work that seems odd to you. Uh, it's a very smart man um, because he realized that that new hires, what new hires see is a window into how the organization behaves. After you know, a month, two months, we no longer see those things. We become enculturated. It's like wallpaper. You know, we don't re don't remember the color of the wallpaper in the room because we ne never think about it. It's just background noise. But new hires see things fresh. And sometimes that's a good way of getting a, a sharp window on both the positive and negative aspects of a culture. But, cu you know, culture is very important because behaviors and attitudes, for example, um, if if your knowledge management, your your document management infrastructure is not reliable, uh, a behavior will, you know, you never know if it's the correct version, for example, a behavior will surface in the culture where people hoard their own resources, because I'm, I, I, for my job, I need to be sure of the quality and the consistency and the accuracy of the documentation, I need to do my job. So I hoard my stuff, right. Um, but if somebody asks me to share, that I don't know if it's relevant to them. And so I'm cautious about sharing. So here, that, that's just one um, uh, you know, aspect of culture that, uh, that, that we've observed. And there are many others. And we have a, a framework of, of um, personas, uh, types of behavior, patterns of behavior that we've observed across different organizations that we use. In that e example in number three there, what are the dominant values, attitudes and behaviors around knowledge and information? Usually there is an explanation for a behavior. And often that explanation gives some clues as to what you can do to solve it. So in, in the case of the example I gave you, the squirrel, the, 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 you know, the, the hoarder, um, the, the, the solution is to increase trust in the quality and accuracy of the shared information. If you increase trust in the platform, hoarding behavior no longer becomes necessary. Um, I, I'm going to move on. I'm, I can see there's another question from Mazna there, and I'll come back to that. Um, but let me move on to um, the, the, so the other piece of the multi-instrument approach. This is a framework from the book. Um, this is simply pointing out that there are different phenomena that we can look at in a knowledge management assessment or um, uh, audit. We don't necessarily have to look at all of these. In fact, it's probably overkill to look at all of these, but depending on the goals of your KM assessment and where you are at the moment as an organization, you may want to focus on two, three, or four of these at a time in combination. Um, so on the right-hand side is what I call direct audits, where you're actually you are directly auditing the knowledge in an organization. So you're looking at, maybe looking at uh, knowledge stocks, what resources you have. You might be looking at knowledge flows, how it moves around the organization. In both those cases, you can use knowledge mapping techniques. You may be looking at knowledge goals and needs. And there we have a framework, for example, around identifying pain points around three core functions of an organization. An organization must coordinate an organization must remember what its commitments and plans are, even as people come and go. So the documentation side of things, it must retain key capabilities over time, as a university must, even as academic staff come and go. And it must be able to take in new knowledge from the environment and adapt as an organization. Um, so we have a framework for that. There are other frameworks you can use to identify knowledge uh, goals and objectives. And then on the left-hand side, is what I call indirect audits, where you're looking at the factors that make knowledge effective in an organization. Um, so you might be looking at knowledge management enablers, um, and policy is one of those enablers. Uh, have you given direction? Uh, are, you, are you setting out clear expectations? Uh, this is addressing Masna's question uh, around um, how knowledge uh, should be managed and used. Have you got a governance structure um, for, uh, for how your knowledge uh, is used? And then you've got the KM processes themselves, and, and those are listed in quite some useful detail in the ISO 30401 standard. Or you may be looking at general knowledge management capabilities around you know, leadership, governance, um, knowledge sharing, uh, information management, um, learning, innovation, um, things like that. Uh, if you're looking at KM enablers and KM processes, the ISO 30401 standard is a good place to start. 
If you're looking at knowledge management capabilities in general, then there are lots of knowledge management maturity frameworks out there. They both on the left-hand side, they run the flattening out risk, just to be clear. These are general frameworks that are not context specific. So if you are using any instruments on the left-hand side, you must build clear sense of context from the right-hand side. So you need a balance of right-hand side and left-hand side instruments. For example, uh, one of the most common foundational activities in a KM assessment should be a knowledge mapping exercise, where you're, you're mapping knowledge stocks, mapping knowledge flows, maybe both. Those knowledge maps are your representations of specific contexts in the organization. And then you can look at your KM capabilities and your KM enablers and your KM processes relevant to those contexts. So it is very important to get a sense of context. Um, but, but, you know, uh, depending on your goals, you might use a different combination. All I'm saying is balance um, right and left side. Um, just to Masna's question, uh, does having a KM policy and framework, um, is it a must before you can really go into KM? No. Lots of organizations start with KM on a small scale in a specific context, trying to show value, and they only really move into policy and framework once they have a sense of what it is their knowledge management should be doing. It's very difficult to give guidance good, clear guidance through a policy until you know how KM relates to your organization. Now, if you want KM to be super effective across the organization, you've got KM going and you want it to be coordinated and you want to make sure it's a good use of, of resources and you, you, know, you are committing resources to it, then uh, a KM policy is, is essential because that's what coordinates and orchestrates and directs the resources to where they should go. All right, last piece. Um, I talked about the importance of having a more discriminated typology of knowledge types. Um, and for many years, we've been using this. We call it the wheel of knowledge. It's actually based on um, the Ashen framework from Dave Snowden and the references there on the slide. Um, we've slightly adapted and, and expanded that framework, but it's essentially Dave Snowden's work um, and it, what it does is it shows a spectrum of um, knowledge, for the forms that knowledge can take in an organization, uh, described in a very naturalistic and easy to understand ways, which means that when you've got people doing knowledge mapping, um, they are reporting consistently. That's, that's, that's the importance of a naturalistic typology. And as you move from the top down to the bottom, you're getting more and more tacit, right? So you've got different forms of tacit knowledge. Um, and then on the right, you see that diagonal line separating the, the, the right-hand side from the left-hand side. Uh, on the right-hand side, you've got forms of knowledge that are more associated with people. Sitting, they sit inside people. And on the left-hand side, you've got forms of knowledge which are more collectively held. Um, so let's move down. Documents and data is the pure explicit stuff. Um, Method knowledge uh, respects the fact that uh, lots of organizations, lots of teams have established ways of working that are probably not documented. And this is, in fact, the learning curve of new hires. They've got to figure out how the team operates. Uh, it's observable and it can be taught and it can be documented, uh, which is useful. Um, but it's not, um, it's not typically not explicit. It's implicit. And then you've got skills and competencies. And you know, already you should be seeing that understanding these different types, breaking out these different types immediately starts to give clues on how you can manage them, right? So documents and data, document management systems, information management, search, skills and competencies. Well, we have a learning and development function or we have a training function or a teaching function in our organization. That's how we handle skills and competencies. We can define them. We can define the needs. We can deliver, de develop curricula. We can deliver courses. Method knowledge, okay, less tangible, more implicit, but it's observable. The team can document how it works. The team can do training uh, to enculturate, do on-the-job training to enculturate people into ways of doing things. You can build job aids to support uh, these things. So those are the more explicit. And each, each of these begins to imply methods of, of working with them. 
And then as we move more into the tacit domain, you've got experience and expertise, which can only be gained through time and reflection on practice. And if you think about the difference between skills and competencies and experience and expertise, skills and competencies enable you to perform a particular task to an established standard, right? Whereas experience allows people to adapt to unusual circumstances, not standard circumstances. So it's a very different, although it's, it, it, it's, it's achieved through practice as skills are, it's a very different form of knowledge. And it's the deeper tacit knowledge that we often uh, uh, have at risk when people, when experienced people leave the organization or institutional knowledge, you know, knowledge of how we've done things in the past. Um, then on the left hand side, you've got relational knowledge, and this is the, the this respects the fact that um, our brains are simply not big enough to contain all of the knowledge we need for our lives and our work. And so as a species, we store our knowledge in other people, uh, by which I mean we maintain networks, we, we build and maintain networks uh, to people that we know and trust, and we know what they know, and they know what we know, and if we need help, we can we know who to go to to ask. Uh, it's a very basic human function. Um, so this distributed storage of knowledge, which is maintained by building and maintaining useful knowledge relationships with people, uh, which is an often, often uh, neglected part of knowledge management. And again, you know, as soon as, soon as you start to see those, th those two things, relational knowledge and experience and expertise, you can start to think about knowledge management approaches and techniques that would be appropriate. Relational knowledge, networking, team building, communities of practice, experience and expertise, shadowing, um, mentoring, coaching. Um, there are specific interview types or storytelling to, um, um, to uh, transfer um, uh, tacit knowledge uh, through experience and expertise. And then down at the bottom, there is natural talent, which in, um, in Dave Snowden's framework uh, is basically none of the above. So this is unique capabilities of unique people. This is the one form of knowledge for which there is no knowledge management technique, except maybe for hiring a headhunter and having them on retainer. If you lose that person, you've got to go looking for another unique person. None of this knowledge is transferable. So the knowledge management pieces refer to everything except natural talent, which is um, uh, not transferable. Okay, so let me go back to... There uh, is a question one for you, Mr. Patrick from yeah. our own community, asking um, on the question on how can uh, we measure the success of the KM implementations in the organization? Yeah, I saw that so one, I but I'd like to go back to Masna's yeah. question. Okay, sure thing. Uh, yeah. Which was, you know, is there any best method or practice to capture the tacit knowledge? Once you've got a, a typology like this, uh, you can actually see that there is a range of methods depending on the form, the degree of tacitness of the knowledge, right? So if it's skills and competencies, there is a tacit component to that. There's quite a large tacit component. It's knowledge in the body. Um, and um, uh, uh, But we have techniques for that, right? We have training techniques and we have practice techniques and we have coaching techniques uh, to, to build those skills and competencies. If it's experience and expertise, it's more challenging. There's a wider range of methodologies, but there are methodologies. You know, there are um, uh, shadowing, there's coaching, mentoring. There are specific uh, cognitive task analysis interviews um, that you can perform to understand the components or the, the, the aspects of expertise. If you, understand, if you know what the domain is, there are ways of mapping out what it is that experts know that novices don't know. Um, if it's relational knowledge, it's, it's maintaining networks, then there are methods of not capturing, but transferring uh, those, those networks and relationships. If it's method knowledge, which is not really tacit, but it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's implicit uh, in the way that people work, there are methods for uh, approaching that. So my point here is uh, for Masna is, is that once we have a more differentiated typology, it becomes, and it's naturalistic, you know, it's, it's, it's framed in, in terms that people will understand in general, then it does become um, more, uh, more easy to discern what, kind, what kinds of knowledge management techniques might be useful. Not just to capture, that's the point. Some forms of tacit knowledge cannot be entirely captured. In those cases, your objective will be to transfer, not necessarily to capture. 
Uh, that's a very important point. Okay, so um, I'm going to come back to um, the question of measuring the success of KM implementation in a moment. I want to round off um, because I'm, we're, running, we're running close to time and I wanna make sure we have time for additional questions. Um, this is an illustration of a knowledge map using that typology. So in this case, we're looking at a business development division. That's the gray box in the middle. We're looking at uh, two activities, business development planning and conducting market studies. And we've mapped out the knowledge resources that are necessary to perform those activities. And we've got experience up there on the left. We've got documents and data on the right. We've got skills and competencies bottom right. Uh, and we've got relationships and networks uh, down at the bottom left. And that's just an, an, an illustration of what a, a knowledge map might look like. And once you have those knowledge maps, you can then start to figure out what do I need to do if I need to transfer this, or if I need to mitigate risk for the knowledge, for the tacit knowledge stuff, experience and relationships. Uh, what, how do I transfer this if I can't capture it? If I can capture it, can I? If I can't capture it, what do I need to do to transfer it? I want to um, sort of answer the question about measuring the success of uh, a KM initiative um, indirectly. I'm going to use this example, which is a very complex knowledge flow map, uh, and the, the the wording doesn't matter to you. It's it's the uh, the way in which the lines are drawn that that makes the point. This is an example from an organisation that thought its knowledge management problem was very straightforward. They needed a better search engine because everybody was complaining that they couldn't get access to the knowledge they needed. But this organization uh, had very mature in knowledge management, been doing knowledge management for 15, 20 years, had lots of knowledge, you know, it's very well structured. It's a property development company, so had lots of well-structured um, knowledge bases, different knowledge bases and platforms built up over the years and databases and analytics platforms. And nobody, uh, everybody was complaining they couldn't find stuff when they needed it. And so it was a search, and they, they interpreted that as a search engine problem. Now, we, we, we knew their platform, and we knew that they had a search engine that was perfectly capable. <laughs> I mean, as good as any search engine in the market. So we knew it wasn't a search problem. And we persuaded them to do a multi-instrument knowledge audit. So knowledge mapping, uh, culture analysis, pain points analysis. That's what we did in that case. Uh, pain points analysis was about um, silos and not being able to get access, not knowing what was where. Um, the culture analysis was very strangely, it was all about the value of institutional knowledge. And when we looked at the knowledge maps, um, they built knowledge maps and then they looked at other, other organizations, uh, the other, and the knowledge maps are, are comp you know, compiled using explicit knowledge and also tacit knowledge. So the experience, the relationships, the institutional knowledge, and so on. Uh, and what we discovered uh, when they looked at other units' knowledge maps and they identified knowledge that sat elsewhere in the organization that it would be useful to them to have access to, they were all around the tacit knowledge stuff. So there's a very mature organization focused entirely on excellence in managing its explicit knowledge resources. And what we realize is that potential knowledge flows, the, the, the needed knowledge flows, which are the ones in dashed lines here, were all around understanding the context of the documentation. So it was, I need to know um, what our policy was in 2017 on this, or uh, this this policy um, documentation is far too complex. I just need the paragraph that is relevant to my case. Or I don't know where this document is. Um, can you help me? You've been here forever. And so that so there were all of these questions that were happening outside of the formal ecosystem, which are represented by those dashed lines. And the solid lines are the ones that they would have expected to happen, which are the inquiries using the system. And this realization, if we had not had that rich typology, breaking out the different forms of knowledge, if we had not had a multi-instrument approach, we would never have seen this invisible set of needs um, and we would not have been able to design uh, a solution for them. So that's just a, an illustration of, you know, if you don't know, if you don't have a good net 
to catch the fish. You're not going to catch the right kind of fish. Um, how do you know whether <clears throat> your KM uh, practices are working? I want to finish by coming back to this um, uh, chart that I showed you right at the beginning, the flattening out problem. And, and the typical solution, uh, the most obvious solution is to go for the average, and the average doesn't satisfy very many people. That's the black line in the middle. There is another approach. Um, which is called the use of the river diagram developed by Chris Collison and Jeff Parcell. Check it out, the river diagram uh, on, on the net. You'll find some good examples of it. And what you do here, uh, and, and this, by the way, this, this book, uh, this uh, uh, technique is from a book called No More Consultants. And the point of the book is a lot of knowledge management can be done in organizations by themselves if they only understand their own knowledge management needs. Um, and in the river diagram approach, what you do is you take that spectrum of varying behaviors and you basically block out the gap between the top performers and the lowest performers. And they call, uh, it's, it's a river, it looks like a river, and you've got a north bank and you've got a south bank. And what it says is that... Um, uh, if you identify the top performers and you identify the bottom performers, anyone on the scale north of the South Bank is capable of transferring that capability to anyone south of them. So team B can benefit from anybody north of them all the way up to team A. So this basically says, look at the opportunities for knowledge transfer within your own organization because those opportunities exist. And the knowledge management uh, approach um, helps to do that. And my point there is that when you do knowledge mapping and a participatory knowledge mapping, you know, I said engage the, the, the target users right from the very beginning of your KM assessment exercise. They're building their own understanding. They're building their own way, a consistent way of describing how they use knowledge. They are beginning to see how other people use knowledge resources in different parts of the organization. They are seeing opportunities for themselves, even without a formal knowledge management, organizational knowledge management intervention. And so the test of a good knowledge management implementation is not just the enterprise level interventions that come in to uh, address the needs of the organization that have been identified at a high level. It's also the degree of bilateral and multilateral KM activity that happens within departments because they've realized they have opportunities, because they have a way of looking at and describing their knowledge in ways that make sense to them. They have figured out that, okay, here, look, why don't we share uh, this, this resource with that, with that team over there? Because they have something that we want as well. So you get into bilateral trading relationships. The test of success is the degree of knowledge management activities at multiple levels of scale, not just at the enterprise level, but also the activity that happens within, um, within departments and between departments as a result of the exercise. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's my uh, uh, summary. Um, yes, get a sense of the landscape, but it's so important to drill down into specifics, anchor it in the goals of the organization. Knowledge maps are an incredibly important way of uh, getting both specific sense of context, but also generalized patterns because you're using a common typology. Um, go where the maps take you. Um, follow the, the, the lines of inquiry that crop up in the maps. Um, uh, so they, they do give you a, a good spectrum of, of opportunities. And make sure that you are empowering local actions as well as global enterprise level actions. Okay, so that's my, my pitch uh, for today. Um, let me see. Questions? Has Yima... We have two questions for you, Mr. Patrick, yeah. Yeah, so I'll go through the ones in the chat and then if there are any other ones, we'll, we can address those. So a view and reward system for sharing knowledge. Um, personally, I'm very skeptical um, on rewards systems. I am much more uh, inclined towards recognition systems. The reason is that there's a fair amount of evidence that shows once you 
um, attach rewards, um, uh, tangible rewards, uh, to knowledge transactions that should be should be business as usual. Once you make it transactional, uh, it stays transactional, always stays transactional. You can't take away a reward system once you've instituted it without creating resentment. Um, so if you want something to be expected behavior, do not use a reward system. You can use a recognition system, recognizing the value of a changed behavior or recognizing the value of a contribution. And that works even that works better in many cases than a reward system, uh, which becomes interpreted as transactional, changes the whole dynamic. It changes the, 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 the culture into a, uh, a transactional commercial culture, if you like, um, for getting rewards for knowledge. Um, which is not, which is, which means that um, there's no free flow anymore. It's always calculated. Um, how do we capture tacit knowledge from people who refuse to share it? Um, well, the US military have tried to do this um, lots of times with alleged terrorists, waterboarding, interrogation techniques. None of them really matter. Not, not, none of them really seem to be effective. I don't, I'm not suggesting that you use waterboarding or torture, um, but, you know, it, there is a full spectrum of techniques. And if somebody is really determined not to share, then, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, there's no point fighting that battle. What you want to do is to create a culture where, um, where sharing is expected, where it's the norm and where it's recognized. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's possible to, um, uh, you know, you, you can change someone's mind uh, by showing them the value of, of their contribution. Um, but you can't force somebody to share something that they don't want to share. And it's not just about capturing uh, knowledge. I want to be clear about this. Um, a lot of the really valuable tacit knowledge that people hold, the experience, the institutional knowledge, the networks and relationships they have, uh, cannot be captured. Uh, they can be transferred. They can be shared, they can be grown uh, in other people, and so we need to, you know, need to be a little bit more um, expansive in the way that we approach the techniques we use related to tacit knowledge. Um, what is the best way to inculcate KM culture in an organization? Um, so there are some good uh, guidelines in the ISO three hundred four hundred one standard. Um, and they recommend that you undertake a culture analysis. Uh, we use a personas technique. Um, there are other techniques around um, um, survey-based techniques, sort of looking at expected behaviors. And, um, and the, um, the book with Nick Milton that I co-authored, The Knowledge Manager's Handbook, um, has a chapter on different approaches to analyzing and identifying cultural changes. But bear in mind, Culture is habits of behavior. That's all it is. So it's whatever you do to change those habits and to make those habits visible in the organization. If the habits are changed and if they are visible, they will scale. That's just the way culture works. Um, okay, so Mazna, to get people in KM ship is very difficult. What does that mean? What do you mean by KM ship? I'll get them on the same page about KM. Uh, okay, yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> I, well, it goes back to what I said earlier, which is to engage your target users as early as possible in your knowledge management assessment or audit uh, technique because they will then build their own perception. You know, what all you're doing is giving them a framework for understanding and describing to themselves how they use knowledge, where their opportunities are, where their gaps are, where their risks are. That way, that's what you're doing. You're facilitating a process where they build that picture for themselves. They can make sense of their own knowledge needs and situation. And so actually, if you take that approach, if it's a participatory approach, it's much less difficult to get people on the same page because they are writing that page together with you. Um, now, obviously, people come and go and time drifts and so on. You have to keep reminding people. 
um, of that. Um, but uh, in general, the first approach is to be participatory, to build that picture with the people who are going to be affected by the change. They define the change. They will understand the initiatives when they come down the road. Then you have to reinforce and maintain that vision. Uh, and that's through stories. That's through examples. That's through showcasing the good practices that uh, are illustrative of where you want to be. Um, so that's uh, uh, those are the two main tips I would suggest. Um, how frequently should the knowledge audit be conducted? Um, it depends. I mean, there are different components uh, to a knowledge audit. For example, um, a full knowledge audit, I don't think you need to do more frequently than about every two to three years. And sometimes, you know, we've seen organiz organizations doing it every five to seven years, depending on the stability of their environment and the amount of change they're going through. So the full audit, not that frequently. Um, but there are specific things that you pick up in an audit that you might want to monitor more regularly. For example, if you are doing a knowledge mapping exercise and you come up with a list of knowledge gaps that are uh, necessary to address, or a set of knowledge risks uh, that you know you have specific risks that are associated with tacit knowledge and people who are going to leave, and so you want to measure, monitor your progress. You know, put interventions in place to monitor that. So if you if you have uh, specific interventions around specific aspects of what you pick up in an audit, you would probably want to do that on a, on a, at least an annual basis uh, to, to monitor progress. Good, any other questions, comments? So as far as we can see from our YouTube channel, so we do not have the questions anymore. And from our chat also, we do not have, we didn't receive any question anymore. Perhaps the last one that you have been answered. So I think um, that's right up our sessions for today. Uh, thank you so much to you, Mr. Patrick Lamb, for sharing your priceless knowledge and uh, experiences. Uh, it is indeed a uh, very insightful sharing to us. Um, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the sessions. I would like to thank you to all of the participants who have joined these sessions. Um, and yeah, yeah, for your participation to other to other sessions. Okay. And great questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'd like to say thank you for all the good yeah, questions. Yeah, we can we can take the final questions here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sabida, no, Dr. Sabida, just um it's thanking comment, us for yeah. the yeah. sessions. Yeah. yeah, thank you to Mr. Patrick for sharing your experiences and the tidbits about the KM. Okay. Um, so I think, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that wraps up our sessions for today. And on behalf of the Dr. Hikmah Library IIUM, we would like to thank you all of your time and participations in today's events. Uh, once again, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude uh, to our respected speaker, uh, Mr. Pratik Lam, uh, and also to the participants uh, for your presence today. Uh, before we end our sessions, uh, we would like to invite all the participants uh, to switch on the camera so that we can take a group photo. Um, yeah, group photo, yes. So we are going to go one by one, pitch by pitch, yeah? So we have in total how many pages? Okay, we have in total four, four pages. So we're still going to go with the first page first. So yeah, page first, first page, yeah. Okay, so can we, we're going to move to the second page. Third page. And our last page. I think page four should do freestyle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, yeah, it'd be so appreciated if our participant can switch on the camera and do some mini looks, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, we will also like, I would like to apologize uh, for any shortcomings and inconveniences caused today. And we really appreciate and hope to meet you again. Um, we wish you all a pleasant day and stay safe wherever you are. Thank you for your participation. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Patrick. Yeah.